Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello there, you're watching the press preview of First Look at What's on the Front Pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the journalist and author Christina Patterson and the journalist and author Matthew Syed. So let's see what's on some of those front pages now. The Observer leads with more pressure being put on the Home Secretary Amber Rudd to resign over the treatment of immigrants. This time it is the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, telling her to go. The Sunday Times claims it has evidence Russia tried to swing the UK's general election in favour of Jeremy Corbyn by creating thousands of fake Twitter accounts. The Express says an SAS soldier and his wife have had to act as Prince Harry and Meghan Markle on their wedding day for a security rehearsal. In an interview in the Sunday Telegraph, Community Secretary Sajid Javid says his own family could easily have been caught up in the Windrush scandal after him emigrating from Pakistan in the 60s. Good night, Our Little Gladiator is the headline on the front of the Daily Star, a tribute to toddler Alfie Evans, who died in hospital. And we're joined tonight by the journalists and authors Christina Patterson and Matthew Syed. Hello uh, to you both. Yeah. We're going to kick off uh, with the Sunday Times, which it has an expose. Uh, Russians accused of trying to swing the election for Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. Well, this is... Um rather alarming and and credit to the sunday times they've been doing lots of really good investigative work recently and did a lot of work on uh, anti-semitism in the labor party which um has resulted in the meetings that took place earlier this week and all kinds of other things so you know it's really making waves and having an effect for me what alarms what i what i think is most alarming about this story is the whether or not uh, the, the the argument is or what, what the sunday times have uncovered is that various um, so-called bots, Twitter accounts that aren't, don't belong to real humans, but are created and have the names of English women, often rather pretty looking young women. Um, or I are... interviewed somebody whose uh, profile picture was David Gandhi. Sorry, oh, I interviewed really? somebody who, his uh, profile picture was David Gandhi. Really? Very attractive uh, really? Guy. Wasn't David Gandhi. How interesting, how yeah. interesting. Well, anyway, these, these are people who are kind of, you know, tweeting messages of support for Jeremy Corbyn, anti-Tory and so on. And we can't absolutely know whether this had an effect at the last election, but some of these accounts were created clearly, um, especially for electoral purposes. And what is alarming is that Russia clearly is interfering in foreign elections now. Um, there is strong evidence now that that was the case in the US and, um, and uh, it looks as though there was some interference in Brexit post the Salisbury poisoning. It looks as though there were um, bots on Twitter making peddling conspiracy theories. And it looks as though the same thing is happening here. And that is a very new, a very worrying new development because that, that's a whole new kind of warfare. And whether Russia has the military hardware to defeat us and whether it wants to is, is you know a whole different issue but it clearly does have huge power in cyberspace and i think that's where it will be conducting a lot of its hostile activity in in the future Nothing. it's definitely a strong story by the insight team and it's a brilliant investigative team um, and corbyn did surge in that general election campaign didn't he was so 25 mm. percent at the beginning of the campaign went to 40 percent and everyone drew the inference that it was a fantastic campaign mm. by corbyn and he was really connecting with the people and theresa may was having a nightmare they're saying that maybe part of this is now due to these bots these fake people with attractive profile pages apparently is yes. that right they well, are very good looking. i suppose they're thinking that if it's a good looking i mean person, the gentleman really, people i say, interviewed that... denies any um association with russia whatsoever he was right. accused by the government of being a russian bot but as you say there are images uh, that are being used pretty females for example um these automated accounts yeah. that we're talking about in this uh, article here that are That's according to the Times, pumping out an awful lot of material. And they've analysed 20,000 tweets from these Russian accounts. 90% of the ones that are about the Conservative Party are negative. 90% of the ones about Labour are positive. I find it quite depressing 
that because these fictional accounts are retweeting nice or nasty things, that this is going to affect the way that people decide to vote at the ballot box. But clearly, the social media does have an effect. And if you are sophisticated in the way that you calibrate the message, then we know from how Facebook algorithms work that the machine learning algorithms are very good at eliciting clicks onto advertising mm. websites. And mm. in some ways, the algorithms know more about what we're likely to mm. do as a consequence of reading it than we are. Definitely. I'm not sure that you can be quite as sophisticated here because you don't know what the end result is of what the... Because you don't know how people are voting. No. But I'm sure they're using some of that. And you're right, it's a, it's a kind of cyber warfare mm. and Russia have tried to corner the market. Why aren't Twitter... Here's a question. Mm. Why aren't Twitter closing down these yeah, fake exactly. accounts? Exactly. Well, how easy is it well, to can't be that know easy. that well, they're... Well, they, they will have been alerted now. Um, I mean, there was a story this week that Stig Abel, after being on this programme, that his, his wife was um, threatened... That somebody on Twitter said, threatened, that said that they would rape his wife and mm. said, we know where you live. I've had people posting my address on Twitter. And, uh, and Twitter did nothing about it until... Stig got his, uh, you know, informed his Twitter followers. So I'm afraid it, it looks as though Twitter, Facebook and all the social media giants really don't do anything until they are absolutely forced to in these kinds of cases. And often with these automated accounts, they're set up with one name and then as soon as they're closed down, they can open exactly. up uh, with exactly. uh, another. But, of course, social media did play a huge part mm. in the last election mm. and we yeah. know that the, the Tories were slow. Yes. Uh, to uh, embrace social media. Jeremy Corbyn had done far better yeah. uh, on that. And he's got young supporters and mm. they're much more engaged, aren't they, with the social media? Yeah, so interesting story there in the uh, Sunday Times. Um, staying with the Sunday Times, in fact, um, just the next story down, uh, Theresa May facing a cabinet revolt over customs plans. So, uh, Brexit negotiations. Well, we Again. thought we were going to get through a whole evening without mentioning Brexit. We almost did. Who chose this story? It wasn't, <laughs> no, the producer said we haven't got any Brexit, so then we, oh, we okay. thought we better had. Um, Our daily yeah. dose of Brexit. Our daily dose of Brexit. Um, well, David Davies has told Theresa May that she should ignore her chief Brexit negotiator um, unless he ditches his plan to bind Britain into a customs partnership with the EU. Now, this is not a customs union. Theresa May has made it clear that she doesn't want to be part of the customs union. But they're talking about a customs partnership, which may or may not be something we'd be allowed to have anyway. But in, if you have a customs partnership, then we collect the tariffs, I think. Um, and David Davis is very anti Oliver Robbins because I think he is, thinks he's too soft, too much tending, too much trying to soften Brexit too much. Uh, there's very fun, well, I find it amusing at the end. It said, Brexiteer business leaders today demand that Robbins is fired. Well, there are about two Brexiteer business leaders. I mean, the vast majority of business leaders are anti Brexit and are seeing more and more the damage that is likely to be uh, unleashed, but in particularly in relation to. Um, well, you know, in relation to tra trade and, you know, given that we're about to use our, lose our biggest market and given that this week Michel Barnier has said we are not going to get any special treatment for banking and so on. So I, I thought that was a slightly amusing end to the piece. But who knows where all this is going to lead. I'll make a slightly broader point about Brexit because mm. we sort of we followed it, haven't we, over the weeks and months and it goes in a direction no one anticipated. I mean, who saw the Irish border being such a big issue during mm. the referendum I did. campaign? I, I, during the I referendum the, campaign? Oh, oh, well, why wouldn't, you see, why wouldn't you see it as a big issue during the referendum? Well, I don't remember campaign. discussing it with you in the 300 times we did it during the referendum <laughs> campaign. Not Jamie, However, by yeah, exactly. all, <laughs> But, you know, I was going to say... Matthew, I'm sure I talked yeah, about yeah, nothing yeah, that's, that's, all you, that's all you talked about. Um, but Macron, when he gave that speech to Congress, he seemed to me to have a coherent vision of France's place in the world. Mm. Internationalist, multilateral institutions, broadly free market, pro-immigration, and so on and so forth. My sense is that this drift over Brexit is because Theresa May voted Remain. She doesn't have a coherent plan about what to do, and therefore she's triangulating between the two wings of her party. And so whatever part of the party has more resonance and strength at a particular mm -hmm. point in time, she is just finding some midpoint, a centre of gravity to hold the cabinet and the party and the coalition together. And it is 
it's embarrassing to watch, I think, for a nation of this size and credibility to be in this particular position. Um, and we're seeing more drift now. David Davis is upset with what, th uh, what she wants to do in relation to her Brexit negotiator. And none of uh, us, and also, and not even her, has a clue where we're going to end up. Yeah, right? and the Independent, which we're not looking at now, but that also saying that May is going to offer almost free movement after Brexit. And uh, well, it's David Davis be, yeah. reported to be on the brink of resigning. Right. Oh, good. But, um, but, it, but, it's, but, it's, but, it's, her... but it's damage limited limitation, isn't it? Because whoever, if it were Boris Johnson, who, you know, claims to believe in the whole thing wholeheartedly, which certainly wasn't apparent until, you know, until the last minute, really, um, if, it, if he was in charge, he can't rustle up fantastic trade deals. You know, it, the, all the evidence shows we are not going to get fantastic trade deals. So whoever is in charge has to try to come up with solutions that are not going to massacre business. We've already had the lowest level of GDP, I think, in this, this quarter for, I think, six years. Now, whether Bre we, we can't know exactly whether Brexit played a part in that. I know we haven't left yet, but it... If things continue in that direction after next year, that's going to have a very, very big effect on the economic health of this country. And whoever was in charge, that's not something you want to preside over. Um, I just want to give us enough time to talk about uh, North Korea um, mm -hmm. in the Mail on Sunday. So let's move on uh, to that now. A day of history, and we saw those remarkable images yeah. uh, yesterday uh, of the uh, leaders of North and uh, South Korea embracing, holding hands. North Koreans didn't hear about I it. No, it's, uh, they didn't hear about it until late, was it 12, 12 hours after, after Kim returned home? Such a fascinating story. I really hope that, uh, that it is as good as it looks. It's possible that it is. It's possible that this really will um, signal a sea change in relations between North and South Korea and North Korea and the world. I think what, what for me is kind of fascinating about this story is that it's the human angle. Mm. It, Kim Jong-un really does look kind of genuinely enchanted by his champagne and um, going to the South. He is obviously embarrassed by the poverty in North Korea and the fact that they haven't got McDonald's down every street and the fact that it feels sort of primitive. I think he... Um, uh, somebody's quoted here as saying they want they want American investment in North Korea which you know may signal why he's kind of making romance moves towards D Donald Trump now it's um it's fascinating from that point of view because he had a very Western background yes, Kim well. Jong-un and then was suddenly kind of parachuted back into this sort of medieval country yeah. so who knows where it's all going to lead yeah I think there's a chance I mean I'm very cynical about it personally I, I do worry a lot I think absolute power corrupts and his main mm. objective is to sustain the privileges mm. for him in the ruling mm. cadre and mm. I'm not sure he's that bothered about his populace no. and I think probably it's the sanctions that he's worried about and um, anyway, I d desperately hope you're right that some level of humanity continues to mm. exist in his mind and that he does want to have some prosperity for his people. That is not impossible. Mm. But I think we ought to give a bit of credit to Donald Trump, mm. not necessarily a president that we're all enamoured of. But wouldn't you agree, Christina, his uh, rather tough rhetoric may have been part of this? I think it was, but I don't think we could um, we could sort of dignify that with the word of strat with you know the idea that it was a strategic move. I think he was just firing off as he always does, and this may have been an unintended, quite good consequence of it. But it's the we, first I mean, time she has ever complimented <laughs> no, Donald Trump. I did. No, I gave him credit. For something the, I gave him credit for something the other day, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> and of course, we have to watch uh, for the summit between uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un coming up within well, that. Uh, a matter of weeks mm. as well. Um, we're going to have a look uh, at The Telegraph, its front page, and continuing coverage of the Windrush scandal and uh, Sajid Javid, the Communities Secretary, having his say, Matthew. It's, it's a really interesting interview because the uh, Communities Secretary has talked about his parents who emigrated from Pakistan to this country in the 60s. And the quote in the second paragraph is that this could have been his mum, his dad, his uncle, it could have been him. And it really struck me reading it because my father came to this country from Pakistan in the 1960s. You know, he's contributed, he was a civil servant, then an academic, he worked so hard. His work ethic rubbed off on all of his children. A remarkable man, a great patriot, he paid his taxes and did everything he could. He, he, he's a believer in this country. A lot of first generation immigrants, because they've come from a society, certainly in my dad's case in Pakistan, very corrupt. Mm. And if you needed anything, you had to give a backhander here. You got due process, mm. transparency. I know we sometimes take it for granted, but mm. these are great traditions. It's mm. a great culture. Um, and he's been very unwell in recent weeks, mm. and he's been able to turn to the NHS and get fantastic treatment. 
from people who are often immigrants in the hospital mm. at the Royal Berkshire Hospital. Wonderful, wonderful people when mm. I've been down to visit him. Mm. So it's a very moving and poignant interview and it's sort of, if I might just say in finishing though, the political implication is I think it will put more pressure on Amber Rudd in a funny kind of a way mm. because yeah, it, it so. has been quite a, a negative mm. towards his own government. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of that, but I, I do feel, I feel actually quite sorry for Amber Rudd because I, I actually, I think she's one of the more competent ministers. I, I think she's very conscientious. I think mm. she takes it very seriously. I don't think it's all about ego for her. I think she believes in public service and I think she's generally doing, a, you know, a fairly good job in as far as it's possible to do a good job at the Home Office, which is, you know, quite a challenge. I but think if she that... didn't know about the, the targets, is she on top of her brief sufficiently? Well, nobody can be on top of everything that's happening in the Home Office. And it seems as though those were locally set targets. I mean, clearly she should have known. Is that a firing offence? Personally, I don't think so. I think, I think Windrush thing has been an absolute scandal mm. and a disgrace. She didn't set this up. They should have distinguished between people who were illegally in the country and the Windrush people who came here to serve this country and who have been treated like criminals, which has been a national disgrace. But I don't think that um, getting Amber Rudd to resign at this particular point is going to change what's happened in the past or necessarily make things better in the future. Um, OK, let's go to um, the mail, which has a story that was um, broken uh, by my Sky News colleague uh, today about the Sainsbury's Asda super merger. And that's a great exclusive. And it's a, it's a really big story and it's reflected in this huge and very well put together spread in the Mail on Sunday 4 and 5. Because these are brands that have massive significance mm. on the high street. And I think both brands will remain. Asda, more dominant in the north, Sainsbury's in the south. But what they're looking for, above all else, is purchasing power that can push down the price of their supplies and one hopes will be passed on to the consumer to meet the challenge of Aldi and Lidl. Because the supermarkets sector is ferociously competitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, the margins are so small it's now. Small. It's good for us. Mm. I think it will be good for shareholders of these companies. It won't be quite so good for the pharmacy mm. side of them. No. And, and what about Tesco? Well, Tesco is going to have a fight on its hand. I mean, Tesco recovered very well from its uh, boardroom scandal about, uh, which is a couple of years ago, I think, I'm losing mm. track of time. Um, but, and Tesco has had the biggest share of the market. I think it's 28%, and this will take Sainsbury's, mm -hmm. the, the combined group, I think, to 32%. So it will be um, the biggest beast in the, in the jungle. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, as Matthew says, I think this will be good for consumers, and I think it will be tough on suppliers of all kinds, and particularly farmers. And we're going to get a market update on it on Monday morning, so right, we should uh, hear more about that. Um, staying in the Mail on Sunday, and um, we're going to have a look at uh, page seven of the Mail on Sunday. Uh, Holly Willoughby's £20 million pound bid to topple Gwynny. What's she doing? I had no idea that she was so influential, but um, apparently she has set her sights on stealing Gwyneth Paltrow's crown as an online lifestyle guru. Gwyneth Paltrow had this um, blog called uh, Goop, um, which uh, has six lifestyle pillars, um, wellness, travel, food, beauty, style and work. And um, Holly Willoughby is planning to do one of her own and apparently already has a fortune of around 10 million and um, is planning to extend her... She already sells her own ranges of skincare products, perfumes, vitamins and fashion and is planning to build her business empire. I mean, personally, I'm not a fan of gurus, but... Um... Do you have a guru, Matthew? Other than you two? <laughs> it's difficult to say, but I'll tell, tell you what, but this, uh, the broader thing here is I think this issue of lifestyle and figuring out how to live with the anxiety and the pace of the modern world, I think is a big... You know, your book that's coming out on Thursday, The Art of Not Falling Apart, I think it's a big contribution <laughs> to that question. If you don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but it's... it's, it's well, I'm not a guru. Like... I'm not a guru. I'm an anti-guru. I'm anti-self-help. I don't believe that any of this stuff works, basically. We all have to find our own way in life. Well, it obviously pays if it's £20 million. Pounds. Um, Christina, Matthew, thank you both very much indeed. And the front pages, as ever, Sunday Telegraph there. There are two papers leading on the backwash from the Windrush scandal. This is Sajid Javid saying, it could have been me, my mum or my dad, and appealing to voters not to desert the Conservatives because of the scandal. They've also gone big on the Sainsbury and Asda merger, which is all over the press as well. Same sort of theme on the front page of The Observer here. Sadiq Khan, the Labour, of course, Mayor of London, telling Amber Rudd to quit uh, on, on that. Not surprising, perhaps, but there we go. 
Uh, Mail on Sunday has a story about the Conservative MP Charlie Elphick and the Conservative Whips allegedly destroying a file relating to sex allegations. Those go on and on and on. And finally, the Sunday Times has its own big story here, uh, a major investigation with the university about the way that Twitter feeds have supported Labour at the time of the last election and the number of automated Twitter feeds or bots that were supporting Jeremy Corbyn. And we'll talk more about that later on. And again, the Sainsbury and Asda story there. But we're going to start... Who are we going to start with? I think we're going to start with you, Andrew. Great cartoon. And Amber Rudd. Amber Rudd, which often says so much. Uh, she says uh, she's un under siege on all fronts. Last week, knife crime soared on her watch. Uh, Windrush, the great scandal that's been botched by her department, and of course these immigration targets are removing illegal immigrants that she knew nothing about. Yeah. But then, of course, a memo emerges showing that she should have known about it. It's Six a big policy up. for her department, isn't it? A huge policy. It's one of the backbones of the pol of the department, and she will face the Commons tomorrow. And you're quite right; her job is hanging by a thread. Why is she still there? Some would say, well, she's actually a very effective lightning conductor for the Prime Minister, because who was, who was Home Secretary when these policies were put in place? The longest serving Prime Minister since the Second World War, Theresa May. And if you look at the Mail on Sunday today, they say she's been hung out to dry by Number 10, who say um, she's been left to fight alone. They've circled the tanks to protect the Prime Minister. She wouldn't be the first Cabinet Minister to uh, potentially put her job on the line to save a Prime Minister. They don't want to lose her because it would expose the Prime Minister even more and it would also upset the very delicate balance in the Cabinet over Brexit because she's, she's a Remainer. A, voice a Remainer in chief. Now some people have been saying that the press have been attacking her, uh, Amber Rudd, because she's a Remainer. I can tell you the Daily Mail, we're a Brexit paper. We've not attacked her over that at all. We have attacked her lack of competence mm. on a huge issue. But of course, for all of those people from the sort of liberal side of the argument, it's very, very unlikely that if she went, you'd ever get a Home Secretary as liberal as she is instinctively on immigration and other issues. To those liberals who like her a lot, just think who could be her successor if she goes, potentially, Michael Gove. Or Chris Grayling. Or Chris Gray. All well, sorts I think of interesting they thoughts. They do a very good job. OK, and um, we've got the Sunday Telegraph, which I was discussing earlier on, Caroline. Never get yourself photographed in front of a light. I no, it looks like he's got a rather charming hat, doesn't it? But yeah. uh, it is, in fact, a lampshade. Uh, but yes, I mean, things are looking really bad for Amber Rudd, I think. I mean, essentially, it is either dishonesty or incompetence. We've got a good job here from Sajid Javid trying to do some damage limitation, as you say, saying that, um, you know, it could have been him. But the point is really that I think that the, the rot, if you like, goes, goes deep into the Home Office. It isn't just the, the Windrush generation. It's about things like how they keep people in detention and so on. And it's not even that, it's, it's going wider, I think, this kind of what's being called actually by some of the people campaigning around Grenfell, institutionalised indifference. And I think that's coming out really clearly too in this um, an editorial. Leader, yeah. yeah, so a leader in the Observer that's basically um, talking about how in so many aspects of, of government uh, operation now, there is this sense that people are guilty until they're proved innocent, and that's clearly the case when it came to immigration, but it's also the case, as the Observer points out, when you've got ordinary families who are just trying to claim mm. disability uh, payments to which they have an absolute right, yet they can't get them because it's, there's a Kafkaesque process around that as well. It has been suggested, that because of the need to uh, show that your residency, is, your residency papers are in order, when universal credit comes in, there is going to be a much bigger problem affecting around two million people when that happens. I think there's a real problems being stored up on the issue of, of universal credit. I think there's going to be real problems stored up for the EU citizens themselves when it comes to registering them. And those very, I, very I, real worries. I, I would just say briefly, to defend Amber Rudd and the previous Home Secretary, there is nothing wrong with a government trying to enforce a policy to remove illegal migrants or, you could argue, to have a target for removing illegal migrants. It was very odd that Amber Rudd was so reluctant to admit there were any and then promptly abandoned them when Andrew, she said they had them. it isn't just about illegal migrants, is it? The point is the targets were leading people to make uh, those kinds of judgments about people who are here yeah. legally and they the whole culture yeah. was one in which you had to prove yourself to be innocent, you were assumed to be guilty and we've seen how much cause yeah, of okay. the problem well, that's been. A noble target but they've handled it very badly. Let's turn to somebody who probably won't be turned away by immigration when he arrives. Uh, Donald Trump is coming to visit this country in July, Lisa. 
Yes, you will. And uh, I think a lot of people in Britain are asking about that so-called special relationship when they saw another relationship on show this week. Bromance was very much in the world headlines last week. And in The Observer, uh, they're showing what was what they're calling dandruff diplomacy as President <laughs> oh, Trump dear. flicks away a speck of dandruff and he says, there now, Horrible. you're perfect. And judging from the images coming out of Washington, all the pomp and circumstance, Emmanuel Macron wanted to shake hands with President Trump more than Melania Trump did. But there's a serious <laughs> intent of all this. He, Emmanuel Macron has really weaponized in diplomacy the bear hug. Because after days of hugging and hand-holding, he went to Congress then and then ripped in to many of President Trump's signature policies. A great line, he says, there is no planet B. Mm. Now, for those of you who still hold on to that special relationship, I'm not sure if you still do, there is a letter in uh, The Sun that there is no greater alliance than you and us, you and the US, and we need it even more. The ambassador looking ahead to the visit by Donald Trump, it's now been confirmed for July the 13th. A word in though from the property mogul, Donald Trump says, I'm not going to cut the ribbon at that embassy. It's in Nine Elms. You should never have moved from Grosvenor Square. Location, Nine location. Nine Elms is a little yes. bit south of the river for <laughs> Exactly. The Even yeah. for Donald Trump. He's yeah. a property man. Did you see that? It was a great cartoon in the Sunday Times again uh, on Trump and Monsieur Macron. Uh, there's Donald Trump saying to Mr. Macron, clutching their hand very tightly, <laughs> boy, you're hot. To which Mr. Macron says, that'll be global warming. <laughs> because, of course, he was out there, of course, to try and yeah, get him as well, and, yes. to stick with the Paris Very interesting sort of balance between really kind of cozying up to the mm. Donald on the one hand and then hammering him on the policy. It's a very, very yeah. acute piece of diplomacy there. Probably. It's a very interesting new, new tactic. Uh, yeah. He's, nice President, in person, he President Macron is, is uh, called the Trump whisperer. I think Theresa May wanted to have that mm. kind of a role. Let's see. She held hands as well. Let's remember yeah. when she went to see President Trump, she was the first yeah. world leader to go and, and visit him. she's been criticised yes. for it ever since, yeah. of course. Oh. Let's move to what is perhaps the most yes. significant single political story in the papers today, which is a growing row inside the government over the kind of customs arrangements we might have with the EU after Brexit. Absolutely. So uh, this, I think, is from the, the Times, and it's okay. about the, um, the cabinet revolt over the customs plan. And this is the most recent idea of, of Theresa May, which is a slightly, uh, well, it, it, it's impossible to understand how it could really work, whereby Britain would somehow collect EU tariffs on behalf of Brussels. Um, this is her kind of compromise to get around the fact that she's having this huge revolt, as you know, on whether or not the UK should uh, remain part of the, uh, the customs union. And her proposal, I think, has been, you know, it's been damned by Jacob Rees-Mogg as, as cretinous. It's been damned by Brussels as being unworkable. So but it doesn't been, look like it's going to be a flyer. The, the crucial thing, it's been pushed by Ollie Robbins, who is her chief sort of advisor on, on the negotiating team. And he and David Davis, the, the minister in charge of the Brexit department, now seem they're an absolute loggerheads. Logger heads. And yeah. David Davis, according to the papers, is calling for Ollie Robbins to be sacked, yeah. which yeah. takes us back to the Thatcher years and advisors and Alan Walters in those days. Yeah. You yeah. remember that, Andy. She famously said, ministers decide, advisers advise. But I interviewed David Davis for the Daily Mail, it was in the mail yesterday, and he was quite clear, and he said it in no uncertain terms, we are leaving the customs union. It was in the Conservative Party manifesto, Tory MPs won their election on that manifesto, so he's not interested in this so-called uh, Customs compromise. arrangement. Yeah. But, customs but arrangement. if we do leave the customs union, then the impact on peace in Northern Ireland, the impact on the economy is going to be a nightmare. And more and more Tory MPs know that. And they've got more problems coming up for them. This is uh, more on, on this from the Sunday Telegraph about these two amendments that are coming up uh, next week ah, in the Lords. Can Lord. you explain to me how these work, Caroline? Because <laughs> I don't understand. Oh dear. <laughs> right. Well, you'll know that the Prime Minister has promised MPs that they will have a meaningful vote in yeah. October on the, on the deal. And the problem is that it's not meaningful if what the vote actually is, is, well, do you like this deal or not? And if the or not means then we're out. It's My like the devil in the, the deep blue. Yeah. See, exactly. So very rightly, I think, peers are trying to ensure that MPs would have the opportunity to amend that deal or at least to tell them to go back and and renegotiate it or get it better in my view what they should be doing at that point is going to the country to have a, a people's vote on that final deal because I think it ought to go back to the people they started this process now they've seen all the mm -hmm. information they may well have different views about it and it would be democratic yeah. for them so, to go so back and have a look so at it so speaks the voice of someone who hasn't accepted the referendum result of which no. there are a lot of people in Westminster we're talking about the deal no, there's two no, no, different no, things no, no, Andrew. this is an two agenda this things. is an agenda to scupper Brexit no, completely and one of these amendments is trying to say Parliament should carry on the negotiations rather than the Prime Minister very difficult
One of the things I thought when I was going through today's paper is how quickly we forget good news. Good news passes just like that. Mm. We had some very, very good news this week, which was the North and South Korean uh, leaders coming together and talking about peace. Don't we all love mm. when what had seemed to be the impossible becomes possible? Truly, truly extraordinary history. And yet again, a bromance on the world stage. Look at the two, the two Korean leaders. And you have to say, for the North Korean leader, who his North Korea described as the hermit state, when he suddenly comes onto the world stage, he's got an extraordinary sense of symbolism. They hop over the demarcation line. Hop and then, back again. And then he hops back again. <laughs> yeah. Absolute brilliant. There was real magic in the moment. And, to, you know, and as Laura Bicker, our correspondent, said, you know, it was personal. You had school children who hadn't seen their, their parents for years because they were stuck on the other side. And we should be allowed a moment to say, wow, this, was a great this is moment. good. But now, of course, the, the, everyone is quoting the, 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 what he wrote into the book. And he said, a new history begins now. But the skeptics come back here in the, the Sunday Times. There is so much history. So a history of broken promises, a history of a development of a nuclear program. It's going to be hard going. So let us savor the moment, mm. but brace for us ourselves Absolutely. for what could be years of diplomacy and, and threats, perhaps, as well. Talking about uh, foreign affairs, uh, front page of the Sunday Times, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so this is... Um, and one of those stories, it's clearly an interesting and important story. The question is, did it really have any actual impact on the general election? Well, who knows? But the Sunday Times, which has done great work on social media, exposing all the stuff with Cambridge Centrica, they say they've got incontrovertible evidence. The Russians, from March last year, when there was talk there could be an early election, mm. created a, a number of accounts, 6,500 accounts. They're called bot accounts. They're, they're not real. And they started bombarding people about why people should vote for Jeremy Corbyn. But they've all got great names, haven't great they? Names. They, yeah. they sound like proper people. They're going of Lillian Morgan, Jessica Langdon, but if you <laughs> dig, dig a bit deeper beneath the surface, <laughs> Lillian Morgan and Jessica Langdon's first language is Russian. And uh, yeah. so uh, Corbyn, this will be tricky for Corbyn because people are already saying he's too close to Russia, too close to the Soviets. And But it's an interesting story because they were the masters of social media in the last general election with the Labour Party. And such a, such a okay. reminder, if one was needed, about technology and how what it seems, seems to have such exciting possibilities, mm. you know, such power... Yeah. And then, and then such such peril, and how it's becoming really a negative uh, negative yeah. force. It's a real okay. Yeah. Bill of Rights, so mm. we actually can protect let's, ourselves. Yes. Let's come back, if we may, to the to the story of next week, which is going to yeah. the local elections, Caroline. And you've got um, Labour are much expected to do very very well. And London is going to be the big Labour story. Everyone thinks. Yeah. Labour, Labour are talking it down a little bit at the moment, but nonetheless. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether the uh, the events of the last few weeks, what kind of impact they have um, on the elections in London. But yes, here in the Observer, big spread about Labour makes a final push to seize Tory heartland territories. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I hope they do do some of that. But I did just want to sound a word of caution about the kind of Labour one-party states we're also seeing, places like Islington, which is all Labour except for one green seat. And so it's absolutely crucial, I think, that it's not good for democracy to have these one-party states. Let's have... Um, some mm. real opposition in those places too. So from Islington down to Lambeth, we're hoping to get Greens elected, more Greens elected, so that we can hold Labour to account. Do you think when it comes to national leaders, Andrew, the local election results of any impact at all? Yeah, if you remember, go back all the way to 1990 when Thatcher held Westminster and Wandsworth, the flagship councils, that gave her a new lease of life only to the end of the year. Uh, and, but this, this time it could be the Tories lose Westminster and Wandsworth, which could cause problems yeah, for Theresa May. OK, thanks all. Very interesting as ever. Now, this week the Home Secretary struggled to explain why she didn't know there's a target for expelling illegal immigrants, even though a memo was sent to her boasting of hitting that target. And he struggled to explain how he's properly cutting the cancer of anti-Semitism from his party when two leading Jewish groups that he met complained he isn't doing enough. Meanwhile, she still hasn't explained how she'll come up with a post-Brexit customs plan that could unite her warring cabinet, is credible to the rest of the EU and stands any chance of being approved by Parliament. Ah, oh, well, at least we can all look forward to Trump Day, his imperial visit on Friday the 13th of July. Street parties all round, eh, Allegra and Sweeney? Yeah, Pesto, I want to be at yours, given I know that you are Trump's biggest fan. Now, this morning, loads of political news around today. Firstly, 
a real sense that there's trouble in Brexit land. Brexit is very, very unhappy. And you can see that on the front page of the Sunday Times. They've got a big story about Corbyn at the top there. But this is the one we're looking at. Theresa May faces cabinet revolt over customs plan. The Brexiteers are very, very unhappy about a sense that about this, a sense that there might be resignations ahead. We have had threats before, but I do sense that this time they are very, very unhappy. Now, as if things aren't difficult enough for the Prime Minister, she has fury from another of her cabinet ministers on another front. Here we have Sajid Javid, the community secretary, this time on Windrush, saying it could have been me, it could have been my mum or my dad. And then elsewhere on another flank entirely. She has trouble, does she not, with her Home Secretary. You have the trouble with uh, Amber Rudd on the front page of The Observer. Our guest later, Sadiq Khan, uh, sensing blood, is saying that Amber Rudd should resign. The Labour Party certainly have their tails up on this story. Now, the handling of the Windrush affair was looking difficult for Amber Rudd when it looked like she'd have to apologise for mistakes made by her boss, Theresa May. Awkward. But this week it got even worse because it looked like she has to apologise for her own mistakes. Now, now, the Home Office used to be something of a graveyard for political careers. Theresa May uh, meant that that wasn't true because look at this. Her tenure as Home Secretary is embarrassing for the rest of them. She is out here in the lead with over 2,200 days in the job, goodness me. It's uh, much better um, but nonetheless familiar to this lot. David Blunkett, Jack Straw, Michael Howard all did around, um, well, 1,200, 1,400. So they had pretty good tenures and then you have these doldrums here, these terrible, terrible tenures that really don't last very long, the middle of the Labour, well, the end of the Labour years, Alan Johnson, Jackie Smith, so on. Amber Rudd up here at 656 days. But all weekend there has been speculation that she is on the verge of resigning. We don't think that that's the case, but nonetheless, tomorrow she makes a statement to the Commons. Robert, she cannot afford for it to go wrong, can she? I think that's probably right, Allegra. <laughs> um, Ed Vasey, colleague of Amber Rudd. In the terms of the politics of the last few years, literally no more important issue than removing illegal immigrants. How could the Home Secretary have not known that there were targets? Well, this is the big question that Amber Rudd is facing. I'm a big, big supporter of Amber Rudd. I think she's fantastic. I want her to stay as Home Secretary and stay in the Cabinet. And I think we need, frankly, the Conservative Party needs people like Amber Remain Rudd as stick together. At the top, but it is, uh, you could say that. Uh, but I think she's humane and liberal and sensible and a good Home Secretary. But clearly, you know, she's got questions to answer. It's not been a great week. I can't pretend that it's been you know, an A-plus week for Amber Rudd. So the big uh, moment will be in Parliament tomorrow at her statement, and I'm wishing her well, but she will have questions to answer. And as you say, uh, you've put your finger on it. It, it. it comes down to how much Amber knew about uh, the targets. We've just had Brandon Lewis on another show that won't he be He said that he knew about. about the targets. So well, he, it's slightly well, odd that her deputy the, the knew point, about the targets I think the and point she that, didn't. I think the point that Brandon was making was that uh, overall, uh, you know, there was clearly... Uh, 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 the Home Office clearly wanted to step up what it, sh what it could do about illegal immigrants. Uh, but whether or not there were specific targets and so on in the detail are all issues. And, it, you know, as Joe and Kate will confirm, being in the House of Commons, making a statement like that, and the Speaker doesn't make it easy for ministers. Oh. I, I, I doubt the statement will last an hour. It'll probably last two hours. She will be questioned, and a lot will ha ha hang on that performance. Kate, I mean, you know, you're a parliamentarian of some longish standing. Do you think, <laughs> based on, you know, previous ministers in a corner, that Amber Rudd can survive? I think it will depend what she says tomorrow. I mean, this, the issue really now is whether she lied to Parliament. That, mm. is, the, that is the resigning matter. Right. I mean, the question of targets, I was in the Home Office way back under Jack Straw, who yep. was actually the second longest, mm. and we had targets then, you know, about all these things. We never met them, and I think the one good thing that might come out of all of this is that the Home Office is actually, I believe, quite dysfunctional. I see the way it works every week, and it is dysfunctional. It needs a complete root and branch uh, you know, break. Everybody needs to get in there and sort it out because people's lives are every day, not just the whole Windrush thing, which we can kind of separate out and we hope we've mm. got a solution to that, but every day we are seeing ridiculous things happen of letters being lost, passports being lost, all sorts of things. It needs a complete root and branch shake-up. And she needs to convince is she the, Parliament... Is she, is, is she the well, person to do it? Well, I'm not sure she's that interested in that area. You know, it's a huge, huge area within the Home Office, but I'm not sure that's the bit that she's passionate felt about. is passionate okay. about. Joe, what's the position of the Lib Dems? Do you think that 
the Home Secretary should go? Well, clearly, if it turns out that she's misled Parliament, then mm. obviously she would need to go. Um, we will see what she says tomorrow. Um, I think what I would but say... Having, I just ask, but, I mean, there's, yeah. there's this issue of misleading Parliament, there's also just an issue of competence shouldn't yeah. I mean whether she you know her, her explanation which is she didn't see the numbers wasn't aware of that that doesn't instill huge amounts of confidence uh, does well, it? Well I, I mean you know as Kate has just said you know, the Home Office is a huge department you know in the last year we've been we've had terrorist incidents mm. the security issues mm -hmm. you know the, the Secretary of State can't see every memo and that's why you have junior ministers to to do that but I think what's important is we actually look at the wider culture around yeah. immigration in this country and this yeah. I think should be an opportunity to yeah. have a more positive story because we see that with Windrush that actually people are open to a uh, more positive narrative that just recognise that people come to this country, they work hard, they pay their taxes, they raise their families, they contribute to our yeah. communities, and that's where we need to move the debate to. Let's take a look at what's in this Sunday papers. Today we're joined by Baroness Newlove, the head of the UK Music and former Labour MP, Michael Duggar, and the Telegraph's Brexit editor, Dia Chakravarti. Lovely to see you all this morning. Um, Michael, let's start with you, shall we? And, uh, and a story which... Which has been rumbling on, I think, for, for, for quite a few years now. Um, young families having a problem uh, getting on the, the housing ladder. Well, it's a proper story in the uh, Observer by Michael uh, Savage, who shows that the um, proportion of families headed by a 25 to 34-year-old that own their own home is more than uh, halved uh, over recent uh, decades. Um, an issue that has been talked about a lot, but this is based on a report by the Resolution Foundation involving David Willits, the former Conservative Cabinet Minister, very much a cross-party concern. Interestingly, I think, one showing how these figures also apply to other parts of the country. It's not just an issue in London, though it's very pronounced in London. And really interesting uh, that uh, millennials are spending nearly th uh, a quarter of their net income on housing, and of course they're getting far less space, an average uh, eight square metres less space than they did in 1996. And it's a huge problem for people out there, but a massive political problem, I think, for the uh, for the government and the, and the major parties. So, I mean, is it, just, is it just as simple as saying, dear, that this is a problem just with, with the lack of availability of stock? It is that as well, but I think there is a real problem with us actually building more homes. And I think we've seen that um, over, over, over successive government uh, uh, um, rules, ac a rule actually. Um, and if you, it's, it's quite simple really, isn't it? If you don't build enough homes, if you don't allow the, the private sector to build enough homes, you are going to end up with a shortage. It's just as simple as that. I mean, it's, it, it's not in any way surprising, is it, that Jeremy Corbyn and uh, those in the Labour Party are talking about a massive programme of house building that that's proving incredibly popular it is popular I think I think it's not just in London it is outside and we were having discussions earlier on you know I don't think it's healthy for people who come into London as sofa surfing that isn't a way of doing that and to you know house share with a room it sounds really good but the cost of living outside London is just expensive because the salaries don't accommodate the, the rentage but are, so, are we perhaps Michael I mean, this is your story are we perhaps too tied to the idea that home ownership is the is the ultimate goal for everyone you look at other countries Germany is an yeah. example often cited where it's a it's by no means the norm. Well, I think it's something that's actually intrinsic to, uh, to, to us Brits, I'm afraid. We, you know, we want to uh, get on the housing ladder. And in the music industry now, I deal with lots of people in their 20s and 30s, and it's by far the biggest issue. You know, the government um, is pushing, a, a, making a big effort in trying to get younger people to vote for them. If you look at the Conservative Twitter feed full of, you know, issues about animal welfare or the environment. But the truth is Michael Gove could personally fish out every plastic bottle from the ocean <laughs> until they fix the housing market, you know, they're, they're going to really struggle still, I fear, with younger voters. Uh, dear, your story, the second story on the front page of the Sunday Times. Oh, guess what? The Tory party tearing themselves apart over Brexit again. We, we, were, we were just talking about this in, in the green room. We were saying, has... Has cabinet harmony broken on this? And are we seeing uh, divisions again? I'm not sure how um, deep that harmony ever was, really. There, there's always been this issue of different people having different ideas within the cabinet. But this story specifically talks about um, uh, Amber Rudd supporting this customs plan which is called the labor labor which which wants a labor mobility partnership in which eu migrants would get preferential access to benefits um, healthcare and the uk job market and it would keep us in some sort of a customs arrangement where we would collect EU tariffs on behalf of Brussels. Now, we've seen here that uh, people like Michael Gove and David Davis think it, it is completely unworkable. Um, don't forget... Uh, completely Jacob, bonkers, according completely to Michael bonkers. Gove. Completely bonkers. And Jacob Rees-Mock, last week, speaking at an Open Europe debate uh, event, said it was a cretinous plan. Do you remember? He said, on that, I 
agree with Michelle Barnier. It is unworkable. I don't know why the government's faffing around with it. But, again, Baroness Newlove, I mean, it strikes me that actually if we, we, we were to go down this particular route, there would be plenty of people who voted for Brexit who would, with a, a degree of legitimacy, say, well, look, this isn't what we voted for. There is, and I think even with all these inward fights, if this is true, and um, we always have this every weekend, David Davis, everybody else, the inward fighting, but at the end of the day, it's what the public wanted, and we, we're still st speaking in a language nobody understands, and it's not about we didn't know what we were voting for, actually we're still not talking in a language we understand, so for me, we need to get on with the job, people are very fed up with this, and uh, we've also got domestic bills that we need to get through, so we need to make this, you know, we need to get on with this and stop the inward fighting as such. Still, I mean, Michael, I mean, as someone who's worked in number 10, it is quite something when you've got someone as significant as David Davis having a, a showdown with someone as significant as, as Gavin Barwell, um, uh, Theresa May's chief of staff. Although the kind of David Davis threatens to resign over Brexit shock, you know, story number 558. <laughs> no weekend would be complete without the David Davis threatening to resign over Brexit shock. The only thing I would say is I, uh, I campaigned for Remain. My constituency up in Barnsley overwhelmingly uh, didn't pay a blind bit of attention to what I had to say <laughs> and voted to, uh, <laughs> to Brexit. Can do. That's but the, what you can do. I, I genuinely <laughs> feel, you know, this idea of the customs union, I think there is, there is a basis of national compromise there because that is a way of saying, look, we're out of the EU, we're respecting uh, the vote, but many of those Brexit voters I spoke to on the doorstep were saying, look, it's not what we voted for in the 70s. We, will, we like the trading, we like the economic links, but we want to come out of the union. And it strikes me that, you know, the, that the customs union may be the basis not just of a parliamentary uh, 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 consensus, but a national one too, but clearly not the basis for a cabinet consensus. Uh, last story today from you, Vanessa Newlove, and yes. this is in the Sunday Express. Uh, yes. Older workers who can pass on invaluable valuable skills to the next generation it's something, again, it's something again I bang on about, maybe because I'm 56, but I actually, and I've got lots of friends who are in this generation, and this is something positive, I'd say, we know about the Conservative Party in a sense, that Esther McVeigh has come out, it's a piece in the Sunday Express by Camilla Tomney. Uh, she's saying older workers who can pass on invaluable skills, which is the key words, to the next generation should be encouraged by businesses. So, for me, I think it's really important because we're told we're living longer, you know, and job skills are different than they are in the modern generation, but I think they can do a lot of mentoring. I think there's a company called Mercy UK mm -hmm. who's already matching the older workers. I think it's a positive. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, off the cliff edge just yet. We're not, as my daughters think, I'm an antique sometimes. <laughs> but, well, you I, know, don't, I don't, obviously. Thank you, you know, um, so... <laughs> but do you, I mean, it's a statement of the blooming obvious, isn't it, when uh, yes. Esther McVeigh says, you know, over the next couple of decades, half the population over 50, yeah. we need an age-diverse world. We do. And, and I, think, I think that's absolutely right, isn't it? I think, and I... I I disagreed with other commentators on this at, at points because we always talk about an aging population as such a negative thing. I can exactly. see that there are negative aspects, but it's also great that people are living longer, healthier lives these days for much longer. And we do need to harness that energy and to make sure that they don't are not always seen as a burden in the society, but can actually contribute. I mean, just a final word from you, Michael. I mean, clearly there, are, there is a lot for the, the over 50s to, to provide in terms of their skills and all the rest of it. But if you're out of work and you're over 50, the chances of you getting back into work mm. are, are pretty slim, aren't they? Very, very difficult. And I think the key thing to focus on here is um, there may well be, you know, a need to uh, to uh, refresh some formal skills amongst that particular demographic. But chatting to uh, employers, um, when I was an MP, you'd get all the time the kind of the importance of soft skills and some of the frustrations with younger uh, younger workers. And when I said, "What do you mean by soft skills?" They'd say, "Well, things like you know, you know, you turn up for work today and you've got to turn up till tomorrow, and you can't leave until home time, and you know, you can't just be staring at your phone all day." And so I, I think they have a, an enormous amount to uh, to contribute. Indeed. Uh, well, I'm sure it's a subject we will be returning to time and again uh, on the programme uh, over the coming weeks and months. Uh, guys, lovely to see you all this morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.